Good evening, all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to have a few stories from people who we'd rather never meet again. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My father was a handsome, young, 20 something, living in a half sketchy, half artsy area in Westport with my mother. They were newlyweds expecting their first child, my older brother, within a month. This was the mid-1980s. At the time, my father was into the whole Robert Smith kind of look, dark long hair and piercings, and kind of had a sensitive feminine look going on. He had been mistaken as a gay before because of his look. Not to stereotype my own people, but you know what I mean here. This is important in a bit. My parents had been shopping around Westport on a street full of little boutique-style shops. My mother stepped into a shop to look around, and my father waited outside smoking a cigarette. He said a man came out of an adjacent store and struck up a conversation with him. The man was polite and friendly, but as the conversation continued, he became increasingly personal with his line of questions. Where do you live? Do you want to come over, etc.? My father was young and dumb, and too trusting having grown up in a small Kansas town and being newly transplanted into this large city. But still this man began to strike my dad as odd. Just as it was getting weird, my mother came out the store, came up behind my father and looped her arm through his. Like I said, my mother was heavily pregnant at this point, and as soon as the man saw my mother do that, he stopped what he was saying mid-sentence, turned around and walked back into the adjacent store without another word. They both thought it was odd, but frankly my dad was glad to be away from the man. They continued shopping and went on. That man ended up being the Kansas City Butcher, or Robert Birdella, an active serial killer in the Kansas City slash Westport area. His MO was to lure gay men into his home, sexually assault them, torture them, and then finish the job. He was caught only a few weeks after his encounter with my father when a victim escaped his home, fleeing down the street in only a dog collar. My father highly suspects that Bob Burdella was scoping him out as a potential victim, and upon seeing my pregnant mother, realized he wasn't gay. Oh, and the shop he came out of? That was his shop, Bob's Bizarre Bazaar an oddity shop that displayed the skull of one of his victims in the window. I was almost snatched up to what I believe was a trafficking ring when I was a little girl. Let me elaborate. Back then I didn't even know what that was. I just got a creepy feeling from a man who was following me and my grandfather around the store. I don't remember much from when I was little, but this man I remember perfectly. I was a blue-eyed, platinum-blonde-haired tiny girl who was even on the cover of newspapers in the area. When me and my grandpa went to this new Walmart, I just remember getting this strange feeling and looking to my left to see a man six aisles down hiding behind an end cap, but leaning back staring right at me. He ducked behind the end cap when I noticed him, and I turned my head back to my grandpa. But when I looked back, he was there again looking right at me hiding every time I saw him. Everywhere we went, he was behind us. My grandpa even noticed, and I was too shy to say something. Though, I should have, because he was a police officer, and thinking back, I definitely should have said something. When we were leaving the store, I could see the man trying to catch us up, but when we got to the car, he was looking around the entire parking lot. My grandpa actually drove by him, and I ducked down below the window so the man couldn't see me. I've never felt so scared like that, nor have I ever encountered anyone who looked at me like I was prey. I never understood what he was doing or why he was following me, until I turned about 19 and started learning about the trafficking rings through social media. I really don't know if that was it, or if he was just a super creep, but I know that my fight or flight kicked him for the first time, and it was something I will never forget. To preface, I am a 23-year-old female and was 19 to 20 at the time of meeting this girl. 
I was also in an unstable and codependent relationship at the time and was utterly depressed, naive, and craving a sense of validation of my thoughts and feelings that no one around me at the time was willing to give me. So subsequently, I was the perfect candidate to inflate and dote upon the literal god-complex ego of this one girl. To begin with, I was in an acting 101 class my first semester of college and swore to myself that I wouldn't make friends in the two years I was set to be there, as this was community college. I would go in, get good grades and leave. It wasn't until the third day, a week and a half since the semester started, that this girl walked in and you could feel the air in the room grow thin. Her presence was both alluring and yet annoying at the same time. Charisma seemed to ooze out of every pore and shine like a halo from her hair. For more context, I'm from the US, and when this girl began to speak with a British accent, everyone was confused and yet intrigued. Apparently she had only just gotten there from a trip back to England with her father. Apparently that's where she was from. That's when my first instinct rang clear. Why is it that if she has enough money to be flying back from England, what is she doing in an acting 101 class at community college? I decided my curiosity was too frivolous and kept it to myself. Until the next class, when she asked me a question. I don't remember what the question was. However, I do remember my initial disgust with her demeanour. She seemed too bubbly, too poised. Something was just off. After that brief encounter, I felt that was all I'd ever hear from her. However, slowly, she would make remarks at me during the class and eventually, I started striking conversations as well. Then one day after class, she mentions to me how expensive and annoying it is that she had to wait for an Uber every time class ends. I remember offering her a ride home as an alternative, but she would dramatically decline, saying things how her parents would get angry with her for burdening me with the task of driving her around. I understood, and felt pity for her after that. In that moment, I thought she was in a household where her parents were overbearing and slightly abusive, so I decided I would try and befriend her outside of class. She seemed nice enough. I also had this pang in my heart to help her for some reason, and that was exactly what she wanted. So over time, as we grew closer, I would offer her a ride home. I would insist and say that I'm her friend, and that friends would help each other out. She seemed to enjoy these gestures. She'd compliment me, and then go on to say how tough her life is without a license. Eventually, she agreed and I took her home. It was honestly really nice to have someone to speak about class with outside of class. Soon enough, after driving her home the past few classes, she invited me for a tea. I thought it was adorable having afternoon tea and gossiping with a friend. She was British after all. We both eventually opened up about ourselves and spoke about things besides class. She told me she was my age and she graduated the same year as me and took a gap year. She said throughout school she'd travelled to and from England, and I found that fascinating. She was adopted from a third world country and was brought to England and then moved to her current town when she was six. She told me about past relationships, and I opened up about mine. She always seemed to be the same to me, like she was trying to emulate me in some way. It was so subtle, it was difficult to notice at first. If I told her about the apprehension I felt in my current relationship, she'd sympathise and tell me a story about how her ex hurt her even worse. I would always take note of the things she said, because I was not only her friend, but we seemed to share the same experiences. However, hers were always more severe than mine. In hindsight, I know why. But at the time, I just thought how unlucky this girl was and how bad I felt for her past. Soon, it became tradition to drink tea at her house after class, but I had to be out before her mum got home, and if I were to meet her mother, it would be bad. One day, her mum got home early and was surprised, yet delighted to see me. 
She introduced herself and I did the same. All the while, my friend sat, sulked in anger. Her mother seemed delighted, and I was surprised at how welcoming she was. She offered me food and gave me some crackers to take home, and I eventually confronted my friend, asking why she would paint her mother to be that way. She said that she was just kinder to guests than her. I was confused, but I also fully understood. I have a mother who is very similar to that, so I shook it off. One day in class, we got our midterm assignments. We were to prepare a non-verbal monologue in front of the class. We each get our assigned stage direction, and are asked to prepare it in two weeks. One of the stage directions was a girl that comes home crying after having been sexually assaulted. Another girl in our class received this one, but was uncomfortable doing it, and rightly so. A boy in the class criticised her for not wanting to do it, and she ran out of the classroom. My friend and I followed her. The three of us opened up about our past assault and eventually calmed the classmate down. Time passed after that, and a few classes later I was walking with my friend to my car. She all of a sudden runs away from me. I follow her and I'm laughing at her. She had fallen ungracefully to the ground and was in the grass on her knees. I asked her what she was doing. She was being a weirdo. What she did was related to our conversation. She looks up at me with some kind of strange fear in her eyes and says that she saw her assaulter just on the campus. I was shaken at this point because I don't remember seeing anyone walk anywhere near us. She said he walked by and stared at her maliciously. I was very confused and said she must have imagined it, but she was adamant. I was also even more confused because she had told me that she had filed a restraining order against him. How could he be allowed on campus? If he really wanted to go to the same school, there were two campuses in town, in two different towns. So surely he could have gone to the other one. I asked all these questions and was met with little answer, obviously. She said she'd talk to her mother and handle it accordingly. It took weeks to even hear anything about it. I wanted her to bring it up, but she never did. So eventually, I asked, and she gave me a story about how she went to the dean's office after class and fixed things. I remember being confused because I had driven her after all our classes, and she said that they went after I left. But that couldn't have happened, because the school office closed at five, and we would always leave at five. Many of my questions were met with strange excuses, but I remember just letting go. This was a sore subject after all, and I didn't want to upset her any more than she already was. Weeks pass, and my friend and I become inseparable. We seem to know the ins and outs of each other. We even hosted a Friendsgiving together at her house with some of the people from our acting class. Then, the end of the semester came, and I could feel the rift between us grow. I was confused and hurting, she said she wasn't going for a degree, but was just there to take the acting class. I remember being confused. I thought she was a theatre major, like me. She said she was, but I guess she changed her mind. She told me she was going to be auditioning for one of the most prodigious acting schools in London, Lambda, and that she was probably going to get in and never see me again. I remember feeling confused. Why didn't she tell me this sooner? Why did she even get close to me in the semester? Then I thought about how it was probably all my fault that I pushed her to be my friend, but I felt so bad for her. It was like she was asking for a friend without telling me. Eventually, I convinced her it would be good for her to be in a class with me again the next semester, partially because I wanted to selfishly keep her close, and the other part of me because I knew from what she told me that if she never got into Lambda, she'd probably end her life. I feared for my friend so much that I wanted to push her to be in a class with me because she had somehow made me think that I was helping her not take her life. So she signed up for the class and decided to audition with me for the spring musical. But she wasn't going to go with me because she auditioned alone and couldn't talk to anyone before she sang, which I guess was understandable. Soon her audition for Lambda rolls around and I managed to come with her and her parents for that weekend. The audition was actually in New York City, 
It was about an afternoon's train ride away, and her parents were kind enough to pay for my ticket. How I managed to be invited was by her telling me how scared and terrified she was to be with her parents on this trip, so I offered to come to be a buffer between her and them. I was met with polite no's, and eventually, just like all my offers, I was met with a yes. Besides, I love New York City, and when I learned I didn't have to pay, was even more excited. Now, for those of you who are this far, I want you to understand if you haven't already. It wasn't like I was begging this girl to let me do her the favour. She'd answer me in a way that made things seem like I had to insist, like if I didn't ask again, she would be hurt and it would be my fault. In other simpler words, I was being manipulated into doing things for her, but it never felt like it because I meant it. I was much more generous to friends I had just met at the time. So we arrive at Grand Central Station, and I was met by my friend and her mother. We walk to the hotel and everything seemed normal. We go to sleep and I wake up, and to be honest, all I remember about that trip was how scared I was, with this new virus going around, it being January 2020, and how surprisingly, her parents seemed to be such angels. I remember going to the shops with them, and they're just talking about how my friend would like this, and how they wanted to make this for my friend, and how we should go here after my friend got out of the audition. All her parents talked about were her. I was floored. I remember her telling me to stay in the room all day to ignore her parents, but I didn't want to. I now see why. Eventually, we made our way to the New York Public Library. I remember going to the top floor taking pictures of the painted ceiling, standing for about a minute, and then her parents find me and say they're going to have to go get my friend right now. She was in need of some cherry-coloured chapstick and some water. They told me to stay and that they'd meet me later and to explore the city. I said absolutely not. I wasn't walking around alone in a massive city, so I went with them, and I witnessed their panic as they tried to hurry to her audition to find water and the right chapstick in time. All the while, my friend is texting them exactly what she wants and telling them to hurry. We walked about 20 minutes to this building. 20 minutes. My parents wouldn't even come downstairs to tell me something, let alone walk that far to bring me water and a chapstick. They decided too that it would take too much time to get a cherry colored one, and so my friend would just have to use a plain one from her mum's purse. When we get there and meet her in the lobby, when she goes to her parents and sees they have no cherry chapstick and not the right water, she's furious. She gets mad and storms into the audition room, never saying thank you. After that, we go sit in a Panera bread and wait for 20 minutes. Eventually, she gets out of her audition and meets us inside. She was adamant on alienating me from her parents and only wanting to talk to me about her audition. She tells me this story, and I can't help but think she's lying about it. It just all seems so bizarre, but I don't remember the details. I just remember after the story, I told her about my day with her parents, and she was very upset for me spending time with them. She scolded me and asked what we had talked about over and over again for the rest of the trip. We went to sleep and left the next day. I remember feeling very weirded out with my friend after the trip. She seemed to be a lot more abrasive with me afterwards and adamant on not speaking to her parents. Eventually, I learned that the name she had told me she had was not actually her legal name. Eventually, I saw she had a high school diploma from 2019, not 2018, and I asked her about it, and she said that it was a misprint. The misprint turned into her graduating late because she was in the mental hospital a lot. She went to mental health programs, but also traveled back and forth to England, but also went to school two days a week her senior year. She said she did her senior year twice. She only lived in England when she was a child, and she actually lived in England most of her life. Nothing was adding up. All the stories she'd eventually tell never made sense when put together. I remember half-jokingly ask her to write a timeline of her life for me because things never added up. Still, despite all the inconsistencies, I still kept her as a friend. The lies were just far apart from each other to feel like maybe I was the one in the wrong. The cognitive dissonance was growing in my mind though, and this was just the beginning. Now, before I met my friend, I had begun practicing the Wiccan religion. I was a solitary Wiccan who lived by the reed and you harm no one, do what you will. I was actively practicing altruism as a form of devotion to the Wiccan moon goddess and horned god. My friend, coincidentally, was also a practicing Wiccan. We had done full moon rituals together, 
and she seemed to know a lot more than I did, so I usually followed her lead when it came to these. They started out tame, making a candle manifestation wish outside, sitting under the moonlight meditating together. We'd make our wishes out loud, thus getting to know each other's deepest desires. We were very emotionally vulnerable in these moments together, and after our rituals we'd try all kind of divinations and other spell practices in our own little coven. One full moon, just before I had to leave, I asked my friend to do a tarot reading for me on my love life. I had just recently had a fight with my then boyfriend and wanted to know what she saw. My friend seemed to have all the answers about my life when it came to divination, and I was trusting of hers enough to hear her out. She started pulling cards and reading the descriptions. Every single card she pulled was a bad one. It said we'd end in failure, hardship, despair, and that I had to leave him ASAP. I remember wanting to, but I didn't know how. I left that night crying over how horrible the card reading went. To jump back in the timeline, after we started our second semester, I remember opening up to some other classmates that my friend and I were witches. I did it in a way to offer spells for help, but my friend was mad at me for outing us. She never wanted them knowing what we did and I was confused. I wanted to help others and invite them into our little world that I loved so much, but my friend seemed to see it differently. So I respected her boundaries and never brought it up again. Eventually, as I know all of you have guessed, the pandemic started in March of 2020. Classes were moved to online, and so was our friendship. We would FaceTime almost every day and watch movies while on call. Now at my college, the musical was cast before lockdown, and unfortunately I didn't get in, but my friend did. She met all the other theatre majors and started talking to them in their Discord chat during the pandemic. I was never brought into that circle until the summer of 2020. And during that time, even before lockdown, my friend would try to date the boys in the department and even get an obsession with two of them. She had told the first one, who I am now actually dating, that she was friends with his favourite Broadway star and that she'd have them meet. He never believed her. After he turned her down, she became angry and started a rumour that he was actually gay. After that, she moved on to another guy who had a girlfriend at the time. She was even more obsessed with him. She'd enjoyed the chase, the fact that he was her friend, and stayed up late and spoke to her all night and made her happy. He had opened up to me and said she was never the only one he spoke to, and that he was a night owl because of his job, and she'd just be the only one up for him to talk to. During the course of the two months during lockdown, and when people began to feel a bit more comfortable, my friend and I had talked about maybe moving into my house. Now, I have a large room in my parents' basement, and my friend was beginning to scare me with her talks of her parents are awful to her when she's home and just with them. I also have yet to mention that she had an older brother with a form of autism along with other issues, and she talked about how mean he was to her. She's constantly calling me, saying she was going to take her life. I was terrified and decided to open up my home to her. This was the worst but best mistake I ever made, Worse because of the escalation of our friendship getting worse, but best because it really made me realise how much of an awful, manipulative person she truly was. She moved in and everything was great. It was nice to be with someone who I considered my best friend. It was like a never-ending sleepover. I had a spare bed in my room at the time, and she used it for a while until she brought her mattress in, and eventually moved almost all of her things in. Everything she had, however, reeked and smelt like B.O. And when she lived there, she never showered. She'd stay here five days a week and two at her house, and she refused to use our shower and never changed her clothes. She'd just sit on one side of my room and rot for days, only getting up to use the bathroom and pick up DoorDash. She'd eat on my side of the room and leave her mess for me to pick up. Eventually, I brought a large trash barrel for us to use, and she'd fill it in almost daily. I'd try and do moon rituals with her, but she'd refuse to practice with me. I'd asked to do tarot readings, and she'd refuse too. However, the prophecies didn't stop. They got worse. Instead of tarot readings, I'd get dream recalls. She'd tell me these amazing dreams she'd had. They were said to be prophetic dreams brought onto her by the goddess Aphrodite, who she claimed to work with and worship while I was outside doing my moon rituals. 
She'd tell me that I would become a famous actress and I'd date K-pop stars. I'd see the world and be an amazing celebrity. Obviously, I didn't believe her at first, but she'd tell her stories in such a way that it gave me hope. Hope that my hard work would actually pay off. She had the guidance of Aphrodite on her side delivering these messages. I wanted to believe her badly, that I shoved all logic aside to cling to the future reality she was feeding me. I was no longer in a sad and crumbling relationship. I would be cast in shows. I'd be happy one day. And that was what I truly wanted. Soon during the summer, my friend would have another friend over. We'd all hang out, but this new girl was much more my friend's friend than mine. Eventually, however, they began to actively try to keep us from seeing each other. But it never really worked, because eventually me and this other girl became close. We would even work out together in my room while my friend skulked in the corner, eyes closed, listening to music and ignoring us every time we invited her to join us. Also around this time, my friend had the boy she was obsessed over. Now, this is not my story to tell despite the anonymity. I just don't feel comfortable sharing the exact details of this boy's encounter with my friend. But what happened was later told to me by this boy, and it was on a night I was out at my then boyfriend's house. This incident happened in my bedroom, however, and its detail still haunts me to this day. Though rest assured nothing too horrible escalated, but if it wasn't for some sort of intervening that I can't remember the details of, I don't know what my friend truly would have done to him. I remember after that night, despite not knowing what had happened, my friend had grown even more malicious towards me. She began to sow the seeds of fear of the Greek gods in me, saying they were angry with me, and that's why I was having bad days. That was why my boyfriend and I were always fighting. I was doing things wrong, and it was driving me wild that I didn't know what it was exactly. All I knew was that I was upsetting the powers above me by just existing, and that my life was currently a mess. So one night, a desperate and hollow night, I asked my friend again about my future and what I was doing wrong. She looks at me and said, do you want it from me or Aphrodite? I looked at her and said, Aphrodite. My friend enters a meditative state and then looks at me in an evil, sadistic way. Her demeanor had changed entirely. I had never seen it like that. I was told the reason I was having such horrible days was because I had to break up with my boyfriend. I had to do it soon or nothing in my life would come true. No fame, nor success, nor happiness. If I didn't do it by the next full moon, my life would become stagnant, that I would amount to nothing. It was so convincing I could still feel the primal fear I felt right there and then. My friend took the bracelet I had been wearing that was from my boyfriend off me and held it. She told me still, through the persona of Aphrodite, that I was being held down by this bracelet and that in order to rid myself of my boyfriend once and for all, I had to get rid of it soon. I was tasked to toss it in a lake about an hour from me, and to do it only with my friend, but I had to break up with my boyfriend first before ridding myself of the cursed bracelet. I was stunned. I didn't know what to feel. My friend left the so-called trance and never recalled a thing. I told her about the encounter, how scared I was, the fear of being smited, of disobeying an ancient deity. She told me that I never had to do it. I think it was just because she was scared of what she had done to me. Perhaps she thought she'd gone too far, or maybe it was just part of the act to get me to do what she wanted. I'm not entirely sure. But I was adamant on leaving my boyfriend. I had worked up the courage and did it a few days later, but everything still felt off. A few days after that, we drove with another friend to the lake. I invited that friend because I was scared to go with just my manipulative friend. I remember her being angry with me for inviting this other girl, but I didn't care. I knew something was off and there needed to be more people. And I'm so glad of it because I'm not sure what would have happened to me. We were entirely off the grid when we got there. The GPS stopped working 15 minutes before arriving at the lake and we got lost trying to leave. It was a truly surreal experience, and me and that other friend never felt fully safe that entire trip, and my evil friend was too calm. After that, my friend moved out of my house. We got into a fight. It was a night where she got mad at me for missing my ex. She wanted me to cuddle her, and I wasn't comfortable with it, so she went to sleep on her side of the room and sulked. 
waiting for me to beg her to come back, but I never did. We just went to sleep. The next day, I went to speak with my ex about our breakup, finalize things, give things back, and I came home to my friend pretending to sleep while she was laying in the dark smiling. I told her to cut the shit and talk to me. I explained where I was, and she said she knew that my mum had told her, which was actually true. We talked about how she's not getting better and how she was cutting herself again and not eating. She was just lying around all day. She made excuses when I tried helping her change her habits. I was worried, but every time I voiced my concerns, I was met with excuses and blaming for being concerned. So a few days later, she called me and told me that she'd never change and that I'd have to live with her the way she was. At the time, she adopted being diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and claimed to have always had it. I didn't believe her because she only started saying she had it after having watched a Netflix K-drama about a woman with the same diagnosis. I was finally starting to piece together everything she told me, all the lies. I also found out a little before our fight that she was actually a year younger than me after having seen her ID. She explained that the reason for that was because her parents changed her birthday after she was adopted because they wanted a younger baby. She accused her parents of committing forgery. I wanted to take action, but she never did, because it was a lie. Her chosen name was also a lie. She told me so many stories for the reason why she went by a different name after I found out her given name. Her accent was fake. She'd never even lived in England. I believe she made that up after the trip she went on right before classes. I finally saw everything was a lie. When she moved out, she left all her things at my house, so my sister and I packed up her stuff and brought it to hers. She told me she wasn't home and couldn't help us, that she had to go get adult diapers for her dying grandma, who was always dying, apparently. She also said I wasn't allowed to bring her things inside and to leave it all in her mudroom. After we had packed everything in the mudroom, my friend walks out her backyard dressed in the fanciest outfit I've yet seen her in and gets into the car with the boy she's obsessed with, completely ignoring me and my sister. Never even said thank you. I was furious. I housed this girl, cooked her meals if she even ate, listened to her, did everything in my power to care for her, and all I got was a massive screw you and my life was in shambles. I tried confronting her on her lie, and was met with countless inconsistencies and self-depreciative excuses. So I just gave up and never spoke to her again. She blocked me on everything after that and never spoke to anyone from my college either. She's gone from social media as well. All her accounts were either changed or deactivated. To conclude, I eventually got back together with that boyfriend and recently broke up with him on my own terms. I wasn't ready to let that go. I still practice witchcraft, just not Wicca, and am much more educated now than I was three years ago. Like I said, I have a new boyfriend now, and I'm also best friends with the other girl who my evil friend introduced me to. I have an associate's degree in theatre arts, and I've done a lot of work in one year for my local theatre community. I plan to move to NYC this summer. My life is amazing now that the toxic friend, among others, are out my life. I still at times blame myself for being so trusting and naive. All the hurt I caused and how everything happened. I'm much more guarded now, but also a lot more headstrong. I also haven't made a new friend since, but I'm okay with that. There are many more lies that she told, but I eventually figured all of it was lies. But it would just be too long to write. And honestly, I don't remember the timeline too clearly. Thank you for hearing this though. And to my old friend, I hope to never see you again for as long as I live. I think I grew up with a family where the mum had Munchausen by proxy syndrome. Let me elaborate. When I was a baby, next door, a family lived who had a baby my age. We became friends even after she moved away as her parents had more kids and we stayed close. My parents worked a lot and her mum was a stay-at-home mum and typically I would go and play at her house. When I was an older child, about nine-ish, my dad was diagnosed with cancer and my house became a tough place to live in. So on weekends slash vacation time, I would spend long stretches of time with them, sometimes days at a time. They had three kids going on four at this point, all around three years apart. 
They had some type of health problem. They all had some type of health problem. They were always sick, doing hospital visits, heart issues, seizures. One kid even had epilepsy, as well as undiagnosable things that came and went. The kids would miss school. I found hidden truancy violation letters. The husband had illnesses too, but they were more severe and I always felt like it could be the stress for caring from such a large family. The mum had some weird neurotic behaviours. She would always force me to look in her nose and throat to make sure nothing was stuck, and refuse to run errands or leave the house alone. And if she thought I was awake, she would force me instead of her children to go out and do it with her, and often would leave her children for hours at a time. My mum would call to come pick me up from her house after work, and she would make sure we weren't home for hours. So it would seem like my mum didn't want to come get me, and I would have to spend the night there again. When we ate, she often made me eat different food than her kids. Not always, but often enough that they noticed and commented on it too. I was 10 to 12 and had a full eating disorder at this point, so I was generally grateful as the food she fed me was vegetable-based, and the kids would often eat junk food. I didn't think much of it until I was a bit older, and getting fascinated with the movie Sixth Sense and with the disease I thought mirrored the behaviours of this. But as I got older towards my teenage years I became more independent, and after my father passed away I made new friends which the mum didn't like. I recall a Facebook account made for one of her daughters who at the time was five and found my new best friend, and she messaged her in the guise of this daughter, five-year-old's account, to ask her what we were doing together. It was at that point when my best friend told me that I disassociated with the family entirely. I told my mum and she agreed it was strange, but nothing else came of it. There were several times coming home where there would be a message in our phone that the mum was outside, or had tried to stop by, or had waited for a long amount of time for me and my mum to get home if we were out. It was frustrating for my mum too, and a bit strange. Then, when I was in high school, I had a mutual friend that actually was kicked out by his family for being gay, and was adopted by the family. He wouldn't have lived with them for more than a year when he emancipated himself and became homeless over living with them. Most recently, the family has moved across the country, and it seems that the health issues still persist, but it's hard to know the degree through the internet. The kids are older now and I don't know much about them anymore. I don't want to be disrespectful to them, I know the mum loved the kids. It was just a very odd situation when I look back on it. For a bit of background, I, a 17 year old male, was with my 18-year-old girlfriend in England on a little getaway with my parents. Even though I'm 17, I definitely look younger. I'm roughly 5 foot 4, and due to that, I get misaged by different people. I think it should be known for later in this story. Also, I wear a swimming top when I go into a swimming pool because I get anxious. So me and my girlfriend decided it would be cool for us to go for a swim in the pool within a hotel. It was nothing super big or super small, and luckily there was only one other guy doing laps of the pool. Nothing remotely strange in the slightest. This is an inside pool. I put down our towels and the key to our locker on a chain and got in. Around five minutes later an older man, probably 40 to 50, entered the room in a small pink bikini. Obviously it's a bit odd and very uncommon, however I don't really have a real issue with it, each to their own. What got weird is when he entered. Me and my girlfriend kept to ourselves, minimal eye contact with everyone else in the pool, and we didn't speak. However, the guy came over to us almost immediately to say hello. Out of kindness, we both stood high back and smiled. He would swim around the area of us and make eye contact, specifically with me repeatedly. I felt beyond uncomfortable as I wanted a relaxing swim with my girlfriend. He continually swam in our area until he made the comment about how he hopes I don't mind that he wears ladies clothes as he's gay. He looked me right in the eye as he said that. I felt slightly awkward because he was in a bikini 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. However, I couldn't help but notice he was looking at me very often. I was getting more and more uncomfortable. I didn't want to be a nuisance and make my girlfriend leave the pool because of it. Nothing really happened while in the pool itself. Onward from that point, we didn't move around much. Pretty much hovering in one spot with me slightly nervous. He went and spoke to the other guy who was swimming for a while and kept peeking at me while doing so. To be honest, I think the other guy just wanted to swim and didn't really care what he had to say. However, after the chat, he then got out. As the guy got out of the pool and went and laid down on the chair next to the one we had our towels on, I didn't know if he'd specifically chosen that one so that he could look at us, but I could have excused it as a coincidence. Once my girlfriend walked away and I was grabbing my towel, he decided to ask in a specific tone about why I wear my swimming top. This gave me incredible vibes of him flirting in a way, asking me why I didn't take my shirt off when I swam. I was stumped, and I just said, because sunburn, even though we were in an indoor pool. I also said I felt comfortable, because I realised we were in an inside area and probably looked beyond stupid. He smiled and said, hmm, okay. He then looked at me and said, I think you'd look better without one. This made my heart race a little and I was ready to go. I was shocked he even had the guts to say that to me, so I laughed it off and said bye. I personally am of the belief that he thought I was younger than I looked, and maybe that's why he kept eyeing me up. It's pretty sickening. In any case, at least when I left, I didn't have to see him anymore. I wonder what you guys think. Was I misreading a perfectly ordinary situation, or do you think there was something there? Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. If you did, you can let me know in the usual way. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to my members and patrons for all their contributions. Their names are on screen. It really means the world. And if you'd like to see a few more videos, you can see the links on screen now. But until next time, stay awesome. I'll see you in the next one.